focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters Han Dan and Kwon Soa. Guys, welcome back to the studio. Good Good evening. evening. Guys, so we're going to start things off with some uh, North Korea-related issues here. North Korea having fired off what's presumed to be another ballistic missile into the East Sea this morning. Uh, It is the 10th show of force this year. It also marks North Korea's first missile launch since Yoon Sagar was, of course, elected as South Korea's next president. Tan, start us off with this latest news from North Korea. SJ, the South Korean military says it's a type of ballistic missile, and it's now conducting a joint analysis with the U.S. on further missile specifics, also studying whether it was the regime's new type of ICBM. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff earlier said today in a statement that the launch made from the Pyongyang region at around 9.30 a.m. apparently failed, and that South Korean and the U.S. intelligence authorities are analyzing details of the launch. The missile fired from its capital region is believed to have exploded in midair almost immediately after its launch, while it was flying at an altitude of about 20 kilometers. The cause of the explosion wasn't known, but top South Korean experts say it appears to have failed due to engine problems. Some military officials reportedly said it may have been a cruise missile, judging from its low altitude, but others have told reporters under anonymity that the military is zooming in on the possibility of the missile being a new type of intercontinental ballistic missile, or Hwasong-17, as it was fired off from the Sunan airport around its capital, Pyongyang. That's where North Korea conducted what it called an important test to develop components of a reconnaissance satellite, which the U.S. believes involved a new ICBM platform. But because the missile blew up at an early stage, authorities say it's difficult to jump to conclusions before further analysis is made. Many experts say that North Korea's ICBM launch looks imminent, which would be the most serious provocation in recent years since it declared its self-imposed moratorium on ICBM and nuclear tests in 2017. Although today's launch ended in failure, experts highlight the fact that past failures still have moved North Korea closer to its goal of acquiring a viable nuclear arsenal that could threaten South Korea, the U.S. and their regional neighbors. The U.S. condemned today's launch, uh, and a spokesperson at the U.S. State Department told Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency that like the DPRK's recent test of two intercontinental ballistic missiles, this launch is a clear violation of multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions and demonstrates the threat the DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs pose to the DPRK's neighbors and the region as a whole. The South Korean military and experts say North Korea will likely continue Continue firing more missiles leading up to the Day of the Sun that falls on April 15th, which is the birthday of North Korea's founder, Kim Il-sung. Again, uh, because of the lack of information, because it failed, uh, you know, at the start of the launch, uh, very little information. But there were reports uh, prior that uh, North Korea was going to be test firing another ICBM sometime this week. And it does seem like it kind of falls into that uh, at this time. But as we talked about, just because of the incoming administration and the new president come May 10th, uh, Yoon Sagar, he's been very hawkish when it comes to North Korea-related issues. It's, the consensus is going to be a pretty tough road ahead. Uh, for President-elect Yoon suk not to mention because of the ongoing tensions right now, uh, of course, in terms of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so what can we expect from the approaching uh, Yoon administration when it comes to dealing with North Korea issues? Well, it's not only expected to be a tough process for the conservative Yoon suk administration, but also tough for North Korea, as the president-elect is known for his hardline position, as you said, SJ, towards the North and its provocations, such as the latest missile launch. Now, on the election campaign trail, Yoon vowed to sternly respond to unreasonable behavior by North Korea in accordance with principles. So different from the Moon administration, Yoon is not expected to focus on promoting dialogue and reconciliation, but rather on more force. He, however, did also mention the window for conversation with Pyongyang remains open. Yoon had been expressing his skepticism towards symbolic face-to-face meetings or uh, maybe talks for the sake of talks, I should say. As he made clear, he will only sit down with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un if 
the North guarantees complete and verifiable denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. Experts predict the UN administration will launch a new version of the peace process, and it could involve strengthening deterrence and strategic assets through South Korea-U.S. joint military drills, as well as more dependence on U.S. military deterrence uh, capability in the region. Yoon earlier had suggested that South Korea should host U.S. tactical nuclear weapons again to preemptively strike against the North in case a planned attack is detected. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. Army Secretary Christine Wormuth on Tuesday expressed her opposition or rather reluctance towards a possible deployment of nuclear weapons in South Korea. Uh, she made that remark at a symposium organized by a think tank and uh, added that the U.S. has a platform that ensures confidence in terms of deterrence on the Korean Peninsula. Again, I mean, we don't know for sure uh, what kind of measures are going to be put in place uh, when it comes to North Korea issues, but uh, I mean, uh, putting a nuclear weapon in there uh, just in case, I, I think it's going to cause North Korea to react with more provocations. Uh, there is a very good chance that they're going to start testing their nuclear weapons, uh, something we haven't seen in years. Uh, but, uh, you know, just judging by the reports, I mean, it all falls through. I mean, we've been seeing a lot of these missile tests from cruise missiles to, you know, hypersonic missiles and then the ICBMs. And a lot of people are saying that's going inching closer and closer to a possible uh, nuclear weapons test. But... This is the big question I guess we have. I mean, how should Yoon suk kind of handle North Korea's missile provocations at this point? Uh, Tom, let's start off with you. You know, like Hua said, Yoon has been very blunt about his hardline North Korea policy, even going as far as to speak about the preemptive strike on North Korea. Two months before the presidential election in January, he said when there's an indication that North Korea is about to carry out an irreversible and aggressive provocation against South Korea, there is no other option but to block it through a preemptive strike with a kill chain preemptive strike platform. He's also very skeptical about making paper agreements with uh, the North. Uh, he's attacked the Moon administration's end of war declaration as fruitless efforts and saying that the war in Ukraine shows that you cannot protect national security and peace with paper and ink. So any prospect of a deal with Pyongyang is now even bleaker than before. But even so, what I want to see from our new leader is uh, in, in handling North Korea policy is coherency and efficiency. You know, South Korea has flipped its North Korea policy too many times before, and quite frankly, all past administrations, uh, conservative or liberal, have failed to completely solve North Korea's nuclear issue. Every time a government was handing over power to the next administration, North Korea issue was almost always back to square one, as far as I remember. So I'm hoping for more coherency and consistency this time from our new government. For example, if we are not going to lift sanctions, if Yoon song yeol is determined to head that way, then we might as well further ramp up sanctions and see the end result of it. You know, some experts say that North Korea is this close to falling apart from the stifling sanctions. And that could open up another chapter in resolving this whole North Korea's uh, nuclear issue. But of course, the fear then is what if North Korea goes, you know what, we have nothing to lose at this <laughs> point. And that's the worst case scenario. Although, you know, to be honest with you, Kim Jong-un does not want to be in that state where he goes, I have nothing to lose. I mean, he wants to hold on to that power as long of as course. possible. So that's one way. So what about yourself? Uh, how should Yoon Sagar actually handle this, uh, I guess, the wave of missile provocations that we've been seeing? Well, how he should handle North Korea's provocations is a really difficult question. And also the next administration is probably now not all has a lot of things on the on its plate. So they are probably in the coming weeks and months uh, trying to draft up uh, how they should deal with North Korea. But one thing I really wanted to point out is the exact thing that Han mentioned about consistency. So if Yoon wants pressure, then he should continue with that pressure and not all of a sudden, oh, let's have a sudden... Um, pop-up meeting with uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Uh, so I am for the new administration um, putting pressure on North Korea, and especially when it comes to 
、uh, South Korea's response towards North Korea's launches of projectiles, such as ICBM、um, firings.、Uh, but what I'm against is、uh, I'm not really sure about the preemptive strike strategy that、yeah. Ian has been mentioning.、Yeah. But it's really unrealistic because we also got. It's not only South Korea that can make a decision on that. We the have US. the U.S. involved, Japan, and、uh, I mean maybe if we had Yoon Suk Yeol and、uh, former President、uh, Donald Trump, maybe those two partnering up, then maybe a preemptive strike. Uh, would look <laughs> I mean, more realistic, but a now, very dangerous combination. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. Yeah, but now、yeah. we have the Biden administration with the next、uh, Yoon Suk Yeol administration. So I don't think that、uh, these two allies will be too stern on North、mm. Korea. Although Yoon will continue with its with its threats、uh, in the coming you know, weeks、I've, and months. But I've noticed、uh, President like Yoon Suk Yeol becoming a bit more cautious. Now,、uh, now that he's、yeah. actually elected as president, <laughs> I think he's realizing this is no、yeah. joke. This whole、yeah. North Korea-related issues, and you can't just go around saying that you know we might have to you know get ready for some preemptive strikes. Again, very dangerous remark. Something that a upcoming leader shouldn't say. But here's my take on it, and just judging by what I saw with the current Moon administration, if you remember at the time when Moon administration first started, that was their number one priority,、um, and it turned out pretty well in the beginning, thanks to. Ironically,、uh, former President,、uh, you know, Donald Trump. But the thing is, I think ultimately there's a limit to what any kind of South Korean leader can do. Even if it wasn't Yoon Suk Yeol that ended up winning the presidency, and was Lee Jae Myung, the Liberal Party, and he pushes for peace on Korean Peninsula, it's all ultimately it seems like up to the United States. I mean, right now North Korea, what they want is a lifting of sanctions. All right. Even if a liberal government comes into South Korea and they go, listen, we need peace on the Korean Peninsula. Let's try to have dialogue. North Korea is not going to bulge. It, it just seems like that. And but the problem right now is I don't think Yoon Suk Yeol is putting North Korea number one in his priority. And, and rightfully so. I think COVID nineteen,、uh, what we do moving forward, and with the Biden administration, number one priority right now is Ukraine. And so, how much further that's going to go? I think after Ukraine, there's a, the other issue. I'm pretty sure the China Taiwan issue is going to pop up. So it keeps going down. North Korea related issues continue to go down, and so it's going to take a while before I think all the parties kind of get together,、uh, not just North Korea, but you know South Korea, the United States, and maybe even Japan, maybe、uh, until they get together. All right, now it's time to really get this North Korea related stuff done. But、um, yeah, but you know what could bring those parties all together? I don't want that to happen, but there are predictions from experts、okay. that North Korea might conduct a nuclear test around May. Yeah,、and、there are movements in Putin. Yeah, yeah, there is already、and、reports think, of that.、So. Of course, that's not something we want to see. But if that happens, amidst the continuing COVID nineteen crisis and Ukraine crisis, if North Korea launches,、uh, I mean, conducts a、um, nuclear、okay. test around May, then. That will bring the North Korea issue really back to the surface, and we can have all the parties start negotiating with our new president. See, my thing is then, if North Korea does indeed conduct a nuclear test, then for the Yoon administration, that's going to be the number one priority. That's for sure. But is it still going to be the number one priority for the United States? You know, you've actually raised a very good point because I just came across an article today that Yoon Suk Yeol's first priority in dealing with North Korea issues is not dealing directly with North Korea. No. But to make Washington make North Korea issue its diplomatic priority,、mm. that would be the number one task for Yoon Suk Yeol. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way to handle this right now. And, and if you know what, if North Korea does unfortunately conduct a, a nuclear test, then the only thing we're going to see is from you know the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, their priority list being still number one, Ukraine. And then when it was China Taiwan, it's probably going to get bumped up to number two. And so unless this whole Ukraine crisis gets resolved, I don't think anything is going to happen. To be honest with you, and it's、uh, and it's not to blame Yoon Suk Yeol. It's not to blame any government. I think it's just up to the United States at this point, and it really is a deadlock because no one wants to blink an eye. U.S. doesn't want to lift any sanctions. North Korea not willing to hold any kind of dialogue until you know any kind of sanctions are lifted, and we see that with、uh, Iran right now.、Uh, but just going back, Tan, you know, North Korea wrapping up its provocation. We've been talking about this. South Korea and the United States are reportedly reviewing and resumed、uh, joint drills that involve nuclear-capable bombers. 
for obvious reasons. Uh, what do we know so far in regards to this? Right. The joint drills dubbed the Blue Lightning involving nuclear capable bombers have been suspended for about five years since 2017. Uh, the year North Korea declared its self imposed moratorium on nuclear and ICBM tests. But things have changed. And amid North Korea's growing ICBM threat, Seoul and Washington are reportedly mauling the resumption of the Blue Lightning drills. The exercise involves the deployment of B 52H or B 1B bombers from the U.S. Air Force's Anderson base in Guam to the Korean Peninsula. Fighters from South Korea and the U.S. and Japan are also mobilized to escort the long-range strategic bombers. The U.S. had previously planned the drills with South Korea in May 2018, but it ultimately conducted them alone near the peninsula. Given Seoul's concerns, they could escalate tensions ahead of the historic Singapore summit the following month. Now, according to a number of government sources today, the Allies agreed on the need for corresponding measures to the North's possible ICBM launch. And the U.S. has been ramping up its deterrence operations this week, flying an F-35C stealth fighter over the West Sea as part of a carrot-based air demonstration and strengthened its missile interception exercise. Seoul, for its part, is reportedly considering a unilateral exercise involving Hyunmu ballistic missiles and other weapon systems. Systems. Furthermore, the U.S. is planning to beef up trainings of detecting and intercepting ballistic missiles with South Korea and Japan. So I also heard that uh, talks between President Moon Jae-in and uh, President-elect Yoon have been canceled. Uh, this was ha- supposed to happen uh, in, the, uh, in the morning. Uh, what exactly happened here? Right. Uh, I actually thought we would be talking about <laughs> so those talks today. But right. yes, uh, we don't know the exact reason yet for that canceling. Uh, Yoon seok yeols spokesperson said that both sides have decided to remain silent on why the meeting scheduled for this afternoon had been canceled. But pundits analyzed uh, working-level discuss- discussions didn't go as planned, especially Especially with differing views over whether former President Lee Myung Bak should be pardoned. Yeah. If you recall, the ex president has been charged with a 17 year jail term on corruption charges. If he isn't pardoned or paroled, the 79 year old will stay in jail until. 2036, when he would be 95. Now, both President Moon and President-elect Yoon seok yeol also allegedly have different views on how COVID-19 issues should be tackled, specifically how an extra budget bill should be ratified for COVID-19 relief funds. All right, so, I mean, do we know when they'll eventually meet then? Well, not yet. Uh, an official at the presidential office of Tonga De told uh, Yonap News Agency that both sides need time. Uh, that also appears to be as new news outlets are are now focused more than ever on what awaits us after the meeting. Originally, the lunch meeting had been planned to be a friendly occasion where the current president and the president-to-be would engage in light conversations. But now, uh, many outlets are focused on key agendas, like I have mentioned, in regards to COVID-19, also political figures, uh, and so forth. Now, because this meeting has been canceled, many are raising concerns that once Yoon comes into office in May, there is going to be major polarization between the two main political parties. Yeah, especially because the National Assembly is still dominated by the uh, the Democratic Party, so there's going to be quite a rift. Uh, Patrick Pierce are chiming in on our live YouTube saying, don't forget, if someone is standing at the abyss and has no way out, he'll get furious and try to break free by striking back. And this referring to what we talked about with, if we Korea. continue to put in, you know, this crippling sanctions, mm. uh, you know, is... Kim Jong-un eventually going to be raising a white flag and saying, all right, you know what, let's start talking. Or is he going to end up going for the worst uh, is what we're fearing here. We'll have to see. We're hoping that the worst isn't something that we're going to be seeing here. Uh, we're going to move on to the latest on the war in Ukraine right now. Negotiators from Russia and Ukraine having holding, uh, haven't been holding uh, these online meetings uh, since uh, Monday. And peace talks will continue for the third day on Wednesday. Tell, how are the peace talks going at this moment? Well, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has said peace talks with Russia were beginning to sound more realistic, okay. but that more time was needed to ensure the outcome of the negotiations. Zelensky's comments early on Wednesday came as Russia's invasion of Ukraine neared the three-week mark and Russian forces continued their bombardment of Ukrainian cities, including the capital Kyiv and the southern port city of Mariupol. Negotiators from the two countries have been meeting uh, via video link since Monday with a Ukrainian delegation pressing for a ceasefire, troop withdrawals and security guarantees. And the two sides are expected to speak again 
on Wednesday today to hold the fourth round of their peace talks. Uh, Mikhailo Podolo, Podoloyak, an advisor to Zelensky and member of the Ukrainian delegation, has described the negotiations as very difficult and vicious, acknowledging that there were fundamental contradictions between the two sides. But he said there is certainly room for compromise. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov, however, said it was too early to predict progress in the talks. He said the work is difficult, and in the current situation, the very fact that the talks are actually continuing is probably what's positive. And in a hint of a possible compromise, Zelensky said earlier that Ukraine was prepared to accept security guarantees from the West that stop short of its long-term goal of joining NATO. He said Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And we understand that. We are not crazy. For years, we've been hearing about the alleged open door, but uh, we have also heard now that we cannot enter. He said this is true and it must be acknowledged. He's glad that the Ukrainian people are beginning to understand this and rely on themselves and the partners uh, that are helping them. Still, Zelensky again renewed an appeal for a no-fly zone over Ukraine and said new formats of cooperation were needed. And this just in, according to Yanov News Agency, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov have said that they are now inching closer to reaching partial agreements with Ukraine in neutrifying, neutralizing the country. Wow. Um, That's certainly a a positive uh, development, uh, considering all the things that we've seen so far. And uh, again, I mean, it's just so tough to see all these uh, footages and news of all the innocent uh, people dying over in Ukraine. Uh, But um, let's talk about these sanctions that are being put in place. As we know, there's been a number of crippling sanctions put on place uh, for Russia. But Russia has issued a list of sanctions against top U.S. officials, not to mention vice versa. So let's talk about the latest details of these sanctions. Sure. According to Russia's foreign ministry on Tuesday, Russia added a number of individuals on its so-called stop list, banning uh, Americans from entering the country. Now, I could read out the whole list of more than a dozen people, but uh, naming just some of them that everyone knows about, U.S. President Joe Biden, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley, and also uh, Biden's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Uh, and uh, just to name some more, the press secretary of the White House, Jen as well as, yeah, <laughs> Jen Psaki, and also the All CIA familiar names. director, yeah. And uh, other non-governmental individuals are also listed, including the president's son and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now, Russia's foreign ministry said this measure was a response to U.S. sanctions that took effect in the recent weeks, which are part of a a larger um, Western powers responding to Russia's aggressions against Ukraine. Now, realistically speaking, this move seems to be more of a symbolic one, given that authorities of the Biden administration administration won't be traveling to Russia in the near future anyways. But uh, the sanctions are expected to escalate tensions between Washington and Moscow further. In the meantime, the U.S. has also come up with new sanctions against Russian officials and this time also targeted Putin's ally, the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, and his wife. And uh, they will be blocked from accessing U.S. property and conduct business with American citizens. You know, it's kind of like uh, when the United States and a number of other countries placed that diplomatic, uh, what is it, boycott on the Beijing Games. Um, and then basically Beijing said, we weren't even inviting you in the first place. Uh-huh. It, basically, the United States came out, OK, you could put these sanctions in place, but it's not like we're applying to go to Russia anyway. So you're right. It is more symbolic. Um, but these sanctions against Russia, not to mention Belarus, I think it's going to take a toll on them more than these travel sanctions that you're putting on uh, you know, people like President Joe Biden. But uh, again, as the war rages on, I mean, we saw these second and third deaths of foreign press uh, who are covering stories uh, in Ukraine. Tan, who are some of the, the uh, foreign journalists this time? The two latest victims were a veteran video journalist for Fox News, Pierre Zakshevsky, and freelance journalist Oleksandra Kuvshinova. They were killed outside Kyiv after the vehicle uh, they were traveling in was struck by incoming fire on Monday, according to Fox News. 
Zakshevsky, who was an Irish citizen, had repeatedly uh, covered conflict in the field for Fox News, including in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. He was 55 years old. In a memo to staff, Fox News Media CEO Suzanne Scott hailed what she called Zakshevsky's unmatched talent and passion. In a separate memo to staff, Scott said, Kushinova, uh, also called Sasha, was serving as a consultant for Fox News in Ukraine. She was only 24. Jeez. This comes on the heels of the death of a U.S. journalist, documentary filmmaker Brent Renaud, uh, after he was killed in fighting in uh, Irpin, a suburb of Kiyu. Juan Arredondo, a journalist who was with Renaud at the time, uh, was wounded in the incident. Patrick Pierzer says seeing the images uh, from Ukraine is heartbreaking, but we have to stay cool and should not follow our emotion, uh, emotions. A no-fly zone would result in a, train, a chain reaction with nuclear war at the end. Uh, it, it's hard to... I mean, I don't know how you're going to stay cool and uh, not follow emotions with this. But I think one of the things that we got out of this is the fact that these are the reasons why we need to avoid war in any situations right now, and not just in Ukraine, but in other parts of the world. And these are the horrors of wars. And sometimes we have to see this so that, uh, you know, world leaders will go, this is the importance of peace. Uh, But in the meantime, we also saw something extraordinary live on Russian TV. Uh, This was all over the internet. An employee of a Russian state television, mind you again, Russian state television interrupted a live news program to protest the war in Ukraine. I'm sure, again, many of you guys have seen footages of this, but uh, Tom, nevertheless, uh, let's get the details of this. Right. The courageous woman's name is Marina of Shanikova, an employee of the Russia State TV Channel One. She staged an extraordinary show of dissent on Monday night when she held up an anti-war sign behind a news anchor reading the news yeah. live and shouted slogans condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. She was taken away by the police and was released from custody Tuesday and was fined about 270 U.S. dollars, but still she could face a prison sentence. That is yet to be known. She was fined not for the live on-air protest, but for a video she recorded before her protest in Channel One studio, where she urged Russians to join anti-war protests. She said in the pre-recorded video, she said Russia is the aggressor country and one person, Vladimir Putin, solely bears responsibility for that aggression. Of Shanikova, who had worked for Channel One for several years, added that she felt ashamed for delivering Kremlin propaganda. Wow. She said that she was ashamed that she allowed lies to be broadcast from TV screens. Ashamed that she allowed others to zombify Russian people, urging Russians to go out and demonstrate. Such an extraordinary woman. Right? No, it really is. I mean, and, you know, both of you guys being, uh, you know, great journalists yourself. I mean, can you imagine, you know, would that even cross our minds to ever, ever do that? Right. I mean, it really takes a lot, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. And I had to do a second take because I was like at one point when I saw the I saw the uh, the photo first and I was like, what is that in the Ukraine television? No, Russia television. Yeah, I had to check again, too. Yeah, and it's a state-run television. Right. Uh, so it really takes a lot. And we've heard, you know, <laughs> stories about actually uh, Russians who are protesting against the Ukraine war, how many of them have been getting arrested. So she knew what she was dealing with, right. yet... Uh, she, of course, uh, you know, sacrificed all that and got and, involved. And like she said, it still amazes me every single day. You know how one man's dream to, to, to restore the menace of the great Soviet Union is causing all of this. And there's not a single person or a single institution or a single country that can stop this one man's dream. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's really unbelievable. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's, surreal. It's, it's a mm. threat not just to Ukraine, but to all of us. For the rest of the world, no, it really, too. It, it really is, and uh, you know, even for us, uh, having to cover stories like this almost on a daily basis, uh, you know, some people might be saying, you know, you get numb from this, or you get desensitized. No, it's not. Uh, you know, hearing news about this, it's just makes you think once again uh, of all the things that's going on uh, with the world. But uh, really, uh, kudos to you. I I, I can't say I I would have been able to do the same, to be honest with you, Mm. if we're going through the same thing. And I really hope for also for the safety of these kinds of journalists who you know, act uh, in that way as uh, this journalist uh, has done. And But I hope that, oh, on the other hand, I also hope that more will follow suit and that uh, the number itself in these uh, brave people 
can uh, do something. Yeah, I mean, you know, they say that, uh, you know, one person really does take one person uh, to really change uh, what's going on in the world. And, uh, you know, it's hard to say whether or not what her actions will ultimately change the, you know, all the things that are happening in Ukraine. But it's also going to make people braver and uh, say, you know what, I also want to express my uh, you know, free, I want to show my freedom of speech, although I can say Russia, you know, there's very little little of that going on. But uh, this is the least we can do, I guess. I mean, what more can we do as people, right? Uh, but also journalists as well. But uh, nevertheless, let's uh, kind of end things off with some COVID-related news here. So what we're talking about uh, before the show, you know, normal cases, this would have been the number one thing to talk about uh, just because of how concerning the numbers that came in this morning were. Uh, at the same time, it is kind of raising hopes that maybe the peak of the Omicron wave is just around the corner. But nevertheless, so uh, let's kind of get the, the numbers that came in earlier this morning. Sure. Well, this is this actually is an issue that uh, people become numb about. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, feel. And also, if you not only if you check the headlines on Korean news, where actually we still do have a lot of pandemic related news. But if you go on uh, media outlets, uh, on other foreign media outlets, some do not even have a COVID-19 section anymore. Yeah. Uh, I know that, of course, uh, the Ukraine issue, uh, that is what we should have on the headlines and what everyone should uh, put their attention to. But COVID-19 isn't over yet. And here in Korea, in fact, we had an all-time high of infections this uh, Wednesday. 400,741 cases were reported. That's the first time we surpassed the 400,000 mark. And uh, there might have been some confusion among people who actually checked the number yesterday night at at 9 p.m. Because uh, back then, the number was already said to be at above 440,000. But then this morning, we hear that the official number is at 400,741. So that uh, seems to be due to an error and also attributed to cases that have been double counted the day before, which also might be because we now have uh, a shift in uh, the test results because we also, uh, the the local clinics can prove the uh, positivity yeah, through with the, the quick antigen, quick right? antigen, antigen uh, test. So yes, we have this uh, new record high and which is a rise by around 38,000 cases from the day before and an on-week surge by 58,000 infections. And the capital's whole um, had a record high this Wednesday with over 81,000 infections, a slight decline in Gyeonggi-do province at around 94,000. And Incheon now has an accumulated caseload of 500,000 with an additional 28,000 infections. Uh, Meanwhile, 164 people have lost their lives in the past day, and uh, the number of um, people in serious or critical condition has hit an all-time high to uh, standing at 1,244 as of this Wednesday. Uh, Government officials are citing expert forecasts, though, that uh, currently predict our peak will come at around the 23rd this month, which would be around Wednesday next week. And in terms of the actual number of cases, an official said during the peak, daily infections are expected to stand at an average of 370,000 a week. So that would be the average of daily infections in that week, but not the actual peak because we already have passed 400,000. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Kim Bu-gyum said authorities should discuss with the medical community how COVID-19 as an infectious disease can be reclassified from its current grade of level one so that the virus can be medically dealt with in an ordinary setting. What that means is um, we may be treating it as an endemic. Yes. By the way, very quickly, uh, as of 6 p.m. today, uh, over 340,000 cases have been reported. It's uh, 30,000 less than what it was uh, same time yesterday. So hopefully we'll see much lower numbers moving forward here. Guys, as always, thank you very much for your reports and your insights on some of these uh, issues as well. Please stay safe and we'll see you guys again. See you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.